Hare Krishna. So, welcome. And today we will discuss some important questions on the topic of from ritual to spiritual. So, the first question is that why are there so many rituals in religion? Aren't these just mindless? Why do we need to do them at all? Are, are they just superstitions or are rituals different from superstitions? Broadly, we can consider three things over here. First is that rituals are not only in religion. Rituals are in every walk of life. Say, for example, when two people meet each other, they shake hands. Now, what is handshake? Handshake is a ritual for greeting. Now, why do we have to shake hands? Some people can just wave. Some people may hug. Some people may rub their noses. Some people may bow from their waist. Hmm? Some people may just nod with their head. So there are different rituals. So these are all. Now, what do we what what do we mean by ritual? Some we say this is not just ritual. This is manners. Uh, okay, you can call it manners. But then, are manners different from different people? But manners and rituals, they are similar in the sense that they give structure for expressing our emotions and shaping our interactions. So when we meet someone, at that time, how do we express our cordiality? How do we express our friendliness? Well, there has to be some way. And the way things have evolved is that shaking a hand is a ritual for which, by which we express greeting. Now we may say there could be a reason for this in the past. People suspected whether the person is having some weapons or not with them. So in that case, if they shook hands, then they could show that their hands are not carrying any weapons. Well, okay, that could be one uh, socio-anthropological reason for that. But the principle is that the rituals are everywhere. So for example, in cricket, so when a batsman hits, a, hits the ball and it crosses the boundary. Now at that time, the umpire does like this. Now why do like this? And when he hit the ball, baller hit, batsman hits a sixer, then do like this. When the batsman gets out, they do like this. Now why these particular expressions? Now instead of when they're out, instead of doing one finger, they could do three fingers. Yeah, instead of just moving their hand like this, they could just say four. And they could say six. When somebody is at a six, why raise two hands? Well, there are certain ways in which certain things have become correlated. So these are rituals. Now, generally, the word ritual has a negative connotation and it's associated with religion. But if you take the generic understanding of rituals as basically the expression the, the structured expression of emotions and the structured shaping of interactions, then rituals are universal. And of course, rituals in religion sometimes gain a bad name because many of those are thought to be superstitious. They are thought to be irrational. They are thought to be dogmatic. But actually, that is very well, that may very well be true for rituals in worldly life also. So, for example, whenever there are birthdays, the people blow, people blow candles. Now, why blow a candle at all? Now, if you lo look back at the history, basically it ar arises, there are various sources, but one of the most commonly understood sources is that it arises from an old Scandinavian myth that uh, that when a person becomes co completes one year, at that time, some evil spirit enters into their body. And if that person blows a candle, then that evil spirit is driven away. And that's why, especially for small children, you have as many old years old they are, that many candles they put. And now, of course, as people become 20, 25, 30, it's not only impractical to put that many candles. It's also sometimes people don't want their age to be publicized to the whole world. So for whatever reasons, that age part is gone. 
and yet the candle blowing is still going on now how many people actually believe in spirits how many people believe that by blowing a candle that spirit will be exorcised from the body that has been left far behind and yet the ritual is going on and in fact many people uh, when they are blowing candles especially they come from traditional cultures where birthdays may not be celebrated in the same way or may not be celebrated at all they think we are becoming modern and progressive and fashionable when we are blowing candles for birthdays but actually they are they are engaging in activity that is irrational superstitious and completely anachronistic it was based on beliefs which were pre modern but it has become a way in which birthdays are celebrated so if at all we want to rage against irrational rituals why not rage against the lighting of candles and blowing of candles on birthdays so so the point to answer this question is rituals are everywhere in life and ritual structure our the expression of our emotions and the shaping of our interactions Now, having said that while some rituals may have some rational basis i'm talking about rituals in our day to day life some rituals may have a rational basis some rituals may not have any rational basis but still we go on with those rituals quite often now within religious traditions often the rituals have a profound basis in an understanding of our psychophysical <clears throat> functioning that means psycho is mind physical is of course the body so how the mind and the body and their functioning is related based on that certain rituals are prescribed so for example when we go into a temple and then we behold the deity at that time we fold our hands we bow down what is the reason for that that the deity a deity is a manifestation of god god is great in front of god we are small and we are bowing down before him we are expressing our humility before him so humility is an internal emotion and it is best cultivated by certain external actions now somebody say no this is just a ritual well it's not exactly a ritual in the sense of it being blind or irrational or pointless suppose i sit say like this and then i raise my hand up raise my legs up and put them on the table in front of me and say i am feeling i am feeling very humble now well it's unlikely most people in this pose posture it may be a bossy posture or it might just be a relaxed posture but it's definitely not a posture that not normally kindles humility so just as certain externals are associated with certain internals so similarly uh, the rituals that are fashion that are described in the religious traditions of the world specifically we are talking about the vedic tradition based on the bhagavad gita and other related texts the, these rituals are often based on a very profound understanding of our how our mind and body works and how our spirit can be activated and therefore the rituals help uh, provide us a structure for expressing our emotions and for shaping our interactions so <clears throat> will rich do we need the ritual such as going to the temple for worshiping god isn't god everywhere yes god is everywhere the question is not god's presence the question is god's accessibility at he may be present everywhere but he is not accessible everywhere for us so for example let's consider water vapor we understand water in the form of water vapor is present everywhere but when we are thirsty can we just open our tongue uh, and water we just collect water from there no we can't do that we need to go to a place where that water is in a form that we can access we go to a tap we take a bottle water and then we drink it so 
just the presence of something everywhere doesn't mean it's accessible everywhere similarly god is present everywhere but do we feel his presence everywhere so some people may say i feel his presence everywhere well if they really feel it then they're special souls and if they really feel god's presence and if they understand how god is all attractive how the presence of god brings peace brings clarity brings brings purity brings strong sense of purpose it am how it is empowering then they will want that presence more and more and god's presence is manifested more and more in the temples why because that is a place where god is specifically worshiped where he, people consciously and diligently strive for a connection with him they seek to oh, invoke his presence through time tested spiritual practices and thus when people enter into a temple they suddenly feel something special they feel a sense of calmness a sense of deep peace descending into their being and this is often experienced even by people who are not spiritually minded they may just go to various places even tourists who may be skeptics or even sometimes atheists they feel the vibes of this space place are special so they are experiencing god over there so god is everywhere but his presence can be accessed at particular places like temples and that's why we need to go to temples so now we may say that okay but in temples okay we can go to feel god's presence but what is the need to do expensive rituals to worship god why do we need to big grand temples isn't it better if we just feed poor people okay then the question comes over here is this really a polarity is it why are we comparing the money spent on worshiping god with the money to feed poor people why not compare the money to feed poor people with the money spent say on cricket if we consider the indian premier league the amount of money that is spent on ipl which is just last for 50 55 days that much money can feed all the hungry people of india throughout the year well why not why not stop i pick scrap ipl and use all the money to feed hungry people is say no no but that provides us entertainment and why compare this with that that serves a different need this serves a different need well okay is your entertainment more important than people's starvation no but that's also a need people may say okay if you say that's also a need and yes people who watch cricket may also give charity at times okay that's fine then let's consider it from another perspective that for some people temple serves a need for them and it's not just entertainment it gives them peace it gives them moral clarity it gives them a sense of strength and hope amidst life's anxieties and uncertainties so why take it away from them isn't that also need that is being served it is only because some need is being served that people go to the temple today we love, live largely in a free world nobody can force anyone to do anything if people are going to temple that is because they are getting some benefit from it so why deprive people of that now having said that it's not just a matter of need at the expense of everything else see whenever we compare two things often comparison can be a tool for emotional manipulation say we may say that actually the amount of money that america and european union spend on perfumes that much money is enough to feed the hungry people of not just those countries or those part of the world of the entire world now so are we saying that should why why not why don't tell everyone to stop wearing perfumes and just give that money to charity so we say why are you comparing these two things so that's the same point why are we comparing uh, money spent on religion with money spent on money spent for poverty alleviation now having said that that there are so many other areas where we human beings spend money and we don't obsess over why this money is being spent here and why not here 
So why obsess over why uh, money spent on temples? And as compared to those other things, actually, religion is not just about performing rituals. When there is a beautiful temple for the Lord, when he is worshipped with proper rituals, what happens is the, pres the divine becomes more and more present. People have profound spiritual experiences and often those experiences purify them. Often those experiences make people more charitable. It makes, they make them more considerate and compassionate. And that's how people may give more charity also. So throughout the world, if you consider, one of the greatest impetuses for charity is religious injunctions. And we may say people give charity only for religious purposes. No, but religions often contribute to charitable causes also. And if you consider even in India, many of the prominent temples of India, they provide free food to anyone who comes there. They even run food relief programs. The Krishna Consciousness Movement itself runs the world's largest vegetarian food relief program. Is the food for life. So the point is that when we talk about religion and rituals, rather than just isolating that this particular ritual, why, what is the rationale for doing this? We can understand that they're all a part of a culture. And that culture fosters the humane and spiritual qualities among people. And those qualities, if they're fostered, they can transform people. They can help the wealthy to become more charitable. And also, they can help the needy. Quite often when people are needy, when people are poor, so sometimes they may be because they just don't have any job and they don't have any money at all. So many times it is because whatever money they have, they are squandering that money on destructive things, on smoking, on drink, drinking. And if people come to God, they become purified by that. They become, by the connection with God, they get inner purity, they get inner clarity, they get inner strength. And then by that, their self-destructive habits will go away. So if we want to actually transform society, we, we want to say cure poverty. Broadly speaking, just giving some charity to a poor person might feed them once. But if there is a heart transformation of people, that will be a far bigger transformation, far sustainable transformation of society itself. If there is a heart transformation of the wealthy, they will give more in charity. And if there is a heart transformation of the poor who may be having self-destructive habits, then they will be able to use whatever money and resources they have better. So in this way, both these changes are vital. And those changes can be fostered by the spiritual environment that is present in temples. So temples are not just places for performing rituals. They are places for experiencing higher realities, for experiencing God and thereby transforming our hearts. So if you understand this perspective, then we won't uh, begrudge the rituals that are being performed, but rather we'll focus on seeing how they're performed properly and how those can be engines of transforming the human heart and thus transforming society from the grassroots up from inside out. Now, there are so many religious rituals in the world and sometimes these rituals are different. They are opposite. Oh, why is there like this? Well, rituals serve a common purpose, but rituals may evolve cultures in different ways. So when we greet each other, as we discussed earlier, some people shake hands, some people nod, some people rub their noses, some people bow down. So why are these different? It depends on different cultures. But the same emotion of greeting, welcoming, cordiality, those are being conveyed through these gestures. So similarly, there may be different rituals by which people may worship God. People may express their reverence to God. So Hindus may fold their hands, Muslims may raise their hands in namaz, and Christians may move their hands uh, in a particular way for mass. So whatever we are doing, that experience they're expressing their devotion to God. So religions have two different thing, aspects. One is the exoteric, the external aspect, and the esoteric, that is the internal aspect. So the exoteric aspect in terms of the 
specific way things are expressed those can vary from person to person and the esoteric aspect the internal aspect is that which is not uh, that which is not a uh, uh, different if you go and score the ma many of the core principles the, of various religions are very similar so rather than focusing on the exoteric differences we can focus on the esoteric essences esoteric similarities and yes sometimes they may be different also not just different but opposite let's consider traffic rules in some parts of the world we are told to travel on the right side and in some parts of the world actually driving on the right side is driving wrong you have to drive on the left side now if you consider traffic rules in these two countries say britain and america they are opposite and yet the purpose of the traffic rules is the same the purpose is to ensure smooth and safe traveling on the road but that purpose may be served in very different ways for different people and sometimes opposing ways so we need to have the intelligence to see beyond the rules to the purpose similarly beyond the rituals to the purpose so if we see that way then we won't get we'll get fixated or distracted or conflicted by the difference in the rituals we will focus on the common purpose and pursue that common purpose mm, that raises a question that but if it's that simple then why do religions fight with each other in fact religion leads to wars religion leads to violence well this is a common conception that religion leads to violence and i would say that there is a fraction of reality to it but the reality is far far bigger than the fraction let's look at it from four different perspectives first is if religion were the cause of violence then all the places where there was no religion should be perfectly peaceful are they not at all if we consider uh, the two parts of the world giant parts of the world soviet russia and china where there officially atheistic governments what happened over there were they paradises of peace because they were officially there was no religion to divide the people no not at all peaceful in fact in soviet russia and china a total of 100 in soviet russia itself 100 million people were killed in fact if we consider totally the number of people who were killed and they are killed by the government itself in exploiting their citizens and making them conform to ideology and in destroying the non conformists the number of people who were killed were more than world war 1 world war 2 and all the other wars of the last century combined together so if at all we want to ascribe ascribe uh, the uh, violence to any cause the, the historical record shows that the that atheism has led to far greater violence than religion now you say no no this is not atheism this was a particular uh, ideology that just happened to be atheistic that is the marxist communist ideology uh, marxist uh, extremist version of those ideologies okay if you can say that within atheistic people there are further different ideologies and those ideologies lead to violence then can we say that say not the same thing about theists so is it religion that leads to violence as far as statistically we say that it is atheism that has led to far greater than violence than religion but let's look at the major wars of the last century world war 1 world war 2 the vietnamese war the the major wars that we see which of those wars of the last century were caused by religion hardly any of them now even when we say that religion is the cause of some wars and at least even when religion is the professed cause 
but we find what is the actual cause we we go deeper it, it is religion is and religious ideologies they are just a mask they are just a cover up for power for uh, for domination for wealth for or for, for enslavement so basically these are universal human motives they are not healthy motives they are of course uh, regrettable motives but these are universal human motives and different people they come up with different justifications for acting according to those motives and some people will come up with the justification of religion people may fight because of race people may fight because of nationality people may fight because of ethnicity people may fight because of caste people may fight because of 100 reasons and religion happens to be one of those reasons but actually it's a struggle for power it's a struggle for position struggle for wealth quite often we will see that when we talk about religious extremism it is not just that people who are religious extremists they kill people of other religions they will kill others of their own religion so why are they killing others of their own religion both of them follow the same religion so if religion were the cause of conflict then they would be killing only the people of that religion or other religions not their own religion but they often do that why because they are extremists and their extremism is just a result of their own personal distorted conceptions which they want some rationalization for for fighting for gaining domination over others so in this way religion is not the cause of violence actually it is materialism and atheism that is uh is it statistically you can say that is a greater cause of violence but rather than blaming it on religion or on irreligion we need to understand it is it is human who cause war and humans use various justifications for fighting having said that if we truly understand what religion is and what its purpose is then wars will decrease they won't increase because at their core religions teaches that we are all we are all followers of one god we are all children we are all belong to one god and ultimately we are meant to be united with him in his service so understanding this can actually foster peace it won't lead to violence and another way of looking at this is religion provides people inner contentment it pro it if religion is practiced deep properly in the form of helping people to gain spiritual experiences then that will lead to immense transformation that will lead them to growth and purification and that's what will enable them to avoid the inner sources of war the unesco charter says that war arises in human minds and therefore peace also has to arise in human minds and how do you get peace in the human mind by helping people to find peace there and religion especially in the form of spirituality if it provides spiritual experiences that is one of the time tested sources of great peace okay so that may lead to a question what is there any relationship between religion and spirituality so are the two the same things are the two different things not exactly we can say that religion and spirituality at one level are the same at another level they are significantly different so let's try to understand this spirituality is like a higher dimensional science so if you consider in science there is theory and there is experiment so theory gives us postulations about the nature of reality of course science focuses primarily on physical reality so focusing on physical reality means so newton saw a fruit falling an apple falling legend says it fell on his head some people say it fell in front of him wherever it fell the point is the fruit fell and newton postulated a theory maybe there is the principle of gravity maybe every particle of a track part of matter attracts every other particle of matter by a force that is directly proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them okay so that's a theory then what do we do after that experiment the experiment okay 
if there is a force like this, not only a fruit will fall here in UK, it will fall in France, it will fall in India, it will fall in Australia. And not just a fruit, a metal will fall, a stone will fall, a wood will fall, various objects will fall. Like that, when we do experiments, then we verify. So science involves theory and experiments. Similarly, philosophy involves, sorry, spirituality involves philosophy and religion. So philosophy and religion, what do we mean by this? That philosophy, refer, philosophy provides us postulates about the nature of reality. Literally, philosophy means feeling is love, so force is truth. So love for truth. Ideally, a philosopher is a person who is a lover of truth, who seeks truth. So now, with respect to philosophy, we try to find the philosophy. We try to understand what is the nature of reality. For example, the Bhagavad Gita provides us various philosophical propositions. One such proposition is that we at our core are essentially spiritual beings. Essentially spiritual beings. And then that leads us to the next point that, okay, if we are spiritual beings, how do we know that? So if we nourish ourselves spiritually, we'll experience contentment. And if we experience contentment, then we will not feel the craving for sensual things that we feel otherwise. There's philosophy and there's religion. So religion provides us practices by which we can experientially verify the truths of philosophy. So there are philosophical truths which can be verified by, through religion. So in one sense, we could say that if we say, I want to be spiritual but not religious, what does it mean? In one sense, people are saying that, okay, I don't want to be ritualistic. I don't want to have blind faith. I don't want to believe in rituals. And to that extent, that I don't want to be a part of anything divisive, anything um, which is which is which involving blind faith. But that's the that's a blinkered, that's a distorted conception of what religion is and what religion does. Religion is actually essentially meant to provide us practices by which uh, we, each one of us, can experience the truths taught by philosophy. And if you understand this principle, then things become, things become much more transformative. So uh, there could be some religious rituals which may, be out, which may be superstitious and they need to be avoided. But they just are dead weight. But not everything within the earliest traditions is like that. There is much that could be transformative. And once we understand that, then we can actually transform ourselves. We can actually do things in a way that is healthier for us, that is transformative for us. So if somebody says, I don't want to, I want to be spiritual, but not religious in the sense that I don't want to be narrow-minded, that's perfectly fine. I don't want to be ritualistic. I don't want to be dogmatic. I don't want to do anything irrational. That's fine. But at the same time, if you want to actually become spiritual, not just think I am spiritual, then we have to do some practices. Spirituality is not just a state of mind. It is a state of being. It is not just, oh, I think I am spiritual. Rather, we have to elevate our consciousness so that we actually become spiritual. So spirituality is a state of being. And how do we attain that state of being? by purification, by transformation of the heart. And religion essentially provides us practices by which that transformation can happen. So if we consider the selfishness within our heart, the self-destructiveness within us, which makes us hurt ourselves and which makes us hurt others, we would like to remove that. We would like to become more spiritual. That means we gain more greater amount of self-mastery. We gain greater amount of self-contentment, satisfaction with ourselves. We gain a greater le level of... Uh, mastery over our emotions so that we deal with others more sensitively, more considerately. So we would like to have some changes within us. And whatever practices we do for bringing about those changes, those will be our religion. Because today, the word religion has a negative connotation. We may not want to use the word religion. But the fact is, if you understand what religion at this core is, it is a set of transformative practices for us help to help realize spiritual truths and, and thus become spiritual. So if you consider that the bottom of a mountain and the top of a mountain, 
the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness bottom of the mountain is material consciousness so i can't just think i am spiritual and i become spiritual i have to transform my being and transforming my being is like raising our conscious like rising from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain now for doing that we need certain resources we need to follow a path up so those resources are provided by religion so in that sense certainly there's no need to be a uh, narrow minded bigoted ritualistic dogmatic superstitious but at the same time there has to be an openness toward practices which will lead to transformation within us and if we do that then we will be transformed we will be benefited and we will benefit others also so yes be open minded but at the same time so we say that be both spiritual and religious or be religiously spiritual that means do religiously do diligently the activities that can raise our consciousness to the spiritual level okay and then now we may say that aren't some so called uh, practice ritual practices and they just mindless so for example we utter some mantras what is the use of simply uttering mantras how will it go, how is it going to benefit anyone is it better to do something practical yes yeah, certainly we all should do something practical but what what does it mean to do something practical and what things are practical and what things are not practical say if a student wants to study and they have six hours to study but if their mind is agitated their mind is distracted even when they try to study they are unable to study so what is the use at that time if they are not even able to concentrate on their studies if they have calmness of mind if they have clarity of purpose and they can concentrate better so doing something practical is not just being physically able to do things it means also be mentally focused and available for doing those things and practices like mantra meditation what might seem like just the mindless utterance of some mantras some sounds it is actually a transformative practice it helps induce a trance like state of consciousness wherein we steadily focus on one thing and thus we calm our mind and as we calm our mind we move forward we grow in our consciousness and as we grow in our consciousness we actually become more focused so the utterance of mantras can actually transform our consciousness so that we can become more effective in our outer activities now in one sense the mantras are not just ordinary sounds they are sound associated with the divine in fact they are the supreme divinity manifesting through sound and as the divinity manifests through sound because the divine is all pure we become purified as the divine manifests on our tongue in our ears and ultimately in our heart and as we become purified we can do more and more things practically in the outer world so yes let's be practical and let's prepare the ground work so that we can be practical in a in the most optimal most effective way and that ground work is let's sharpen ourselves let's learn to manage our mind let's learn to focus so that we can be the best we can while we are engaged in external activities <laughs> now another way of understanding the mantras is that this is actually a cure for our spiritual amnesia each one of us is a part of the divine but unfortunately we have forgotten that we are parts of the divine so suppose say somebody is a millionaire a billionaire's son and they had some accident and they have hit their head and they have forgotten who they are now one of the ways uh, to provide them therapy is to remind them of the things from their previous life now, hey do you remember this do you remember this phone do you remember this watch do you remember this belt do you remember uh, this particular uh, painting and slowly by this what happens is their memory gets triggered so similarly for each one of us we are parts of god 
ಟೆಂಪಲ್ and there are say, images of the sacred all around in the temple there may be drawings there may be murals and in there is sacred music and there are all sanctified paraphernalia so all of these are to help us remember god and one of the most potent and portable sources of remembrance of god is is holy name it's portable because it's always accessible with us we can't always go to a temple but we can always utter the names of god and it's potent because it's sound it's sound which awakens our consciousness to a higher level so therefore mantras are meant to enable us to uh, regain our lost memory to cure our amnesia and thus to gain the legacy that is meant for us the birthright that is meant for us as parts of god so not only can mantras enable us to do something practical in this world but man- mantras can also enable us to regain our bearings and fulfill the ultimate purpose of life that is to reunite with god god is eternal and when we reunite in love with him we attain life and love eternal and that is the essence of the practice of bhakti to do those loving practices devotional practices by which we awaken our dormant love for god and become united with him so now is bhakti religious or spiritual we discuss about some people want to be spiritual but not religious so is bhakti religious or spiritual well it's both bhakti is definitely a process for spiritualizing our consciousness i talked about going from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain bhakti is definitely a process for that simultaneously bhakti is a set of tangible practices so are those religious yes in conventional nomenclature they go into the temple worshiping a deity and <clears throat> chanting some mantras doing some song, singing some songs hearing some sacred discourses this may all be called religion but they are not religion in, in the negative sense of being superstitious or irrational or dogmatic no they are potent rational and transformative each of these practices if we analyze them carefully we will understand how they stimulate our remembrance of the lord and as we remember him more and more our consciousness naturally rises to the spiritual level so i talked earlier about the top of the mountain being spiritual consciousness we could develop that metaphor and say at the top of the mountain it is the supreme lord who is there it is the all attractive divine reality krishna who is there at the top of the mountain so bhakti provides us practices by which krishna becomes accessible to us like from the bottom of the mountain we start seeing the beautiful beautiful things that are there at the top of the mountain and we feel attracted to go there so in that sense bhakti is both religion and spirituality bhakti is not irrational or narrow minded so in that sense it doesn't have any of the negative connotations associated with religion it is essentially spiritual because it's a set of spiritual practices by which we can raise our consciousness to the spiritual to the spiritual level and become eternally spiritualized thank you very much hare krishna